Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Mami Kataoka, director of the Moriart Museum. And then also I co-curated this exhibition, Another Energy, Power to Continue Creating 16 Women Artists from Around the World. Today, it is a pleasure to welcome Suzanne Lacey, one of the participating artists in this Another Energy show. Um, she will talk about her recent project and then also upcoming uh, project. And then uh, Suzanne and I will have a discussion afterwards. Suzanne is an educator and an author and is considered the pioneer in the realm of socially uh, engaged art. But she's based mainly in Los Angeles um, since 1970s. Through her dialogue with community, there um, she has addressed social issues such as feminism, racism, aging, and violence, and other urban problems. She has been extremely proactive, um, employing performance, video, photography, and community um, activities, and other media in a vast output, diverse in both scale and mode of expression. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Suzanne Lacey. Suzanne, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mami. I am really happy to be with you again. I wish I was with you in person in Tokyo. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk about four projects. As you said, one of them is featured. In fact, the one that I'm showing at the Mori is a premiere. It's the first time it's been shown. And I'm, I'm super excited about that. I wish I could see it in person. Um, can you see my screen? Or I guess I need to share it, don't I? Yes. All right. There it is. Can you see it now? Yeah. OK, so between the door and the street, and this is the piece. This is your photograph, Mommy. In the, <laughs> uh, in the middle of the installation, it's a three-screen projection. It came out of uh, a project in New York in 19, um, I think it was around, excuse me, it was around 2013, I think. And this is the Brooklyn Museum, which was one of the co-sponsors along with Creative Time. And the museum um, sponsored an actual performance in the middle of a neighborhood. The performance is um, in Brooklyn. And in the performance, a hundred, oh, excuse me, 350 women and men were part of a large block party, almost a conversation with about the issues that were important to them in their lives around gender. So in this performance, you were able to go from one porch to another listening to people's uh, conversation in their own language about issues of gender. The idea was to look at how feminism has changed over the decades from the 70s till the 2000 teens. And uh, these women address the variety of issues that um, were you know, part of uh, new concerns around feminism, the intersectional ideas. Um, this is a short video of the project. Uh, can you see that okay? Yeah. Okay. We're re-strategizing. Can you guys gather over here for a minute? We're gonna talk about Sweeping the way, and then we're going to slowly be kind of coming out, and, form, and then they're going to peel off to the right, walk all the way back. I think they're doing something with women and power. That's what I think. Yeah, feminism. <laughs> Whatever you want to say, that is completely up to you. 
He was like, you're still like very tough love, but very gentle with me. Oh, because you're a girl, you can decide. And that's okay, but now I'm like, no daddy, I'm queer, and I don't really, I embrace both genders. It's like very like, oh, you don't need to cry. Like, suck that up, you know? It's very like, daughter or your sister or your mother don't talk to me like i'm your next what, what is something you want for your daughter's education so he was saying i wanted to assimilate so much and i wanted to blend in so the bad of the victim isn't taken into account because then you're not the one crying saw from this um, was a short documentary. And um, I began thinking a few years after this about the, the, the problems with showing social practice or large scale project development in communities. Uh, the problem with mm -hmm. having a work that really operates well in communities and then translates into another life in a museum. And this was the state of this project until the Maury show. And at, at, in preparation for that show, I created a three screen projection that had more scale, more visibility and more of a museum appropriate presentation. So these next projects I'm talking about are projects where I, I was really taking on that idea. How could you create an ethical, engaged work within a community with all of its relationships and complexities of, of formations and negotiations? How could you create that with integrity in a community and then change it so that it operates with the scale of visuality and techn technological productions that is really possible today in museums. And so this project, uh, The Circle in the Square, was uh, in uh, Northwest England, and it's a, it's a region called Lancashire. And in this region, the mills have all been uh, sort of decommissioned. And the textile industry, which was once the driver of this area, has moved on to other countries. And that's created a series of problems, just like um, deindustrialization has in, in many countries. But I'll um, tell you a, a little narrative about one of the problems that it's called, I mean, that it's caused. In, um, in the late 50s, 60s, Pakistani immigrants were invited to this region to work in the textile mills because they had experiences 
uh, doing that. And when they were there, um, people tended to work for eight to 10 hours a day. Um, and so they were socialized a lot. They kept their culture intact, but they had lots of communication between white Christians from that region. Uh, they didn't go to pubs. They didn't go to the religious organizations. They had their own practices, but every day in these mills, they, they mixed together uh, in, in um, you know, friendship ways. Uh, when the mills closed down, like this one, the Smith and Nephew Mill in Briarfield, one of the things that happened is that there was no longer a place where the former immigrants and their families would, would mix. So the cultures became more and more separated. Um, as the mills around the region sort of stopped working one after the other after the other, the region became much more impoverished. There weren't the jobs that brought people there that allowed them to live a decent life. And the cultures became more separated. Um, even the Pakistani and Bangladeshi population became sort of separated from each other by the various um, religious sects that grew up in the region. So I was invited to Briarfield at a moment when this mill was going to be redeveloped, but it was going to be redeveloped into probably a bedroom community of Manchester for professional high income people. And the way this mill was situated is you could go right off the freeway to the mill and not cross the tracks into the rest of the town, which was 45% Muslim. And one of the things that um, happened as a result, or we were afraid was gonna happen with the, was that there would be an even larger estrangement between the communities. So I embarked on a project with um, building bridges Pendle and in situ and super slowways where we started having a series of dinners. And I said, look, we at these dinners, we need to have 100 people and half of them have to be Muslim and the other half Christian. You can't have five Muslim people and 95 uh, Christians and have a really um, engaged project. So this went on for months and we began to interview people who had worked in the mills or whose family had worked in the mills. And we ended up interviewing uh, 75 people and we made videos. And what we asked them about was what life in the mills was like, but also what they, how race was configured and how uh, people in this region were looking toward a new future what they were planning to do. And then I brought this friend of mine from Appalachia, the guy in the white beard, who is a shape note music expert, uh, expert. Shape note or sacred heart music. People sit in a square and they sing a cappella. It's a very sort of democratic art form. Um, so we taught people both shape note and we also taught them Sufi chanting. With a, with a group that we were working with. And then we decided to have a three-day performance. And the, over the course of the three days, there would be, for the first time, this mill would be open for tours in the midst of the reconstruction. And it would people would be able to come in and watch us setting up to film all day Saturday. And they could see the videos that we had made and they could watch the film crew installing. And the idea was that collectively, we would over the course of one day, make a film that would be installed later in a museum. And so we called the project, the circle for Sufi chanting and the square, which is the way that shape note people sang. And over the course of the third day, the Saturday, we had this um, musical kind of lesson where people taught each other first shape note and then Sufi chanting. And we filmed it. And 
we were watching the whole thing through video. And at the end of the day, we had a dinner for 500 people. It was the biggest event that they had had. And the, the dinner was planned and staged so that it was a series of conversations. And I'm happy to say that this was half Muslim community and half Christian community. So I'd like to show you just a very quick excerpt from this project. interesting things about these kinds of projects is how they have a life after. If you work within a community, people tend to continue the work in the relationships that have been built. And not only did we have many of the community members to keep looking at the film as we edit it over the next year, but there have been lots of things that have happened since then. This is an interdisciplinary music between um, chanting or nasheed and um, British choral music. So I'm looking forward to getting back together with uh, people from that community. I have several times and I will again in um, November when that piece opens at, um, at the, um, uh, in fact, I think it, it opens as a two screen installation. I think what I did was, hold on just a minute. Let me see if I can show you the balance of that because it, okay. This is the film that we made and it will be installed. It's a two screen projection and it's all sonic. And what it does is it shares, it co goes back and forth between the circle music and the square music. Let's see if it will load. If not, I'll just show you that these are the two screens. Oh, there it goes. Hold on. Well, never mind. Um, I'll show you now the last project, which is called Across and In Between. And in that project, uh, it's a little um, more difficult to explain because it was a project done on, uh, in the middle of Brexit. And um, Brexit is the, the, um, ex the political event where England decided to leave the European Union. Mm -hmm. And I was invited by 1418 Now 
to do a, a project on the Irish border because one of the things that was difficult about Brexit is that Ireland is divided into Northern Ireland, which is British, a British um, Commonwealth, I guess a part of the British Commonwealth and Ireland, which is part of the European Union. So when they were all in the European Union, there was no problem and the Irish border was easy to cross back and forth and people who lived along the border could easily go back and forth. The history of that border during what was called the Troubles is a very difficult, that separation uh, between uh, the two parts of Ireland was, was very difficult. So now suddenly in the midst of Brexit, what was going to happen was Northern Ireland was going to become a uh, part of the British, the British Commonwealth, and Ireland was going to stay part of the European Union. So suddenly, this border would become very significant again, and it, that border has caused a lot of pain uh, for Irish people and Northern Irish people. So we did, decided to do a project that was fun. And in the model of Ellen Capro's work was a series of happenings along the border. But we would then bring all those border people back together to consider, um, were they in a sense, a third country? That the people that lived along the border were not being represented in this tug of war between England and the European Union. And so we started by going along the border and locating sites where we would do these different events. And so here's an event, that bridge that they're walking toward actually is a bridge. You see Northern Ireland on one side of the bridge and Ireland on the other side of the bridge. So that when that bridge is open as it has been for the past many years, when Northern Ireland and England were part of the European Union, people could walk back and forth freely and, and happily, and, and they did so. So we convened a dance, a yellow dance on the bridge that created the border. And this, we flew planes, I mean, uh, drones overhead and videotaped it. And we videotaped the people coming to the dance and sort of they came together and created a yellow line and then they separated again. And that was sort of the, the project we posed to people. Can we create a yellow line that comes together like a border, but comes apart like a porous border, an open space? So then we went to another place along the border and the border of, of Northern Ireland and Ireland actually runs right down the middle of this, um, this uh, river. And we told these kids we wanted them to find the, the border with their yellow kayaks. And there they are out locating the yellow border and they form a yellow line with their kayaks that comes together and it dissolves. So then we went to another part of the border. And as you might know, Ireland is a place where um, there's a lot of racehorses and actually racehorses actually have passports so they can go back and forth between Northern Ireland or Ireland. And we started thinking about how the border didn't mean a thing to animals. And so we created a yellow border of chalk and we ran the horses across the yellow border and made some very beautiful film. Then we went up to the mountains and along the top of this mountain ridge where the fog comes in, where uh, is the line of the border. You, can almost, you can't see it, you don't know it, but it's in the middle of this really vast park territory. So we got a bunch of runners to come up in the freezing rain to the top of the mountain and we asked them to run up the mountain. And we flew our drones overhead and we filmed them running up the mountain and down again. Here they're coming back. 
And then finally, we, and, and all the while we were doing this, we're interviewing people and talking to them about what's going to happen if a hard border comes in instead of the soft and porous border that's there when they were all members of the European Union. And so what happened was we invited farmers who farm on both sides. There's farms that the border runs right down the middle of it. And we asked the farmers to create, um, create a line with yellow bales of hay with the tractors. And it was very funny getting them to all line the, the bales of hay up. Then after doing this and creating a three screen film from it and a documentary, we invited all these 130 people to come back to the border and um, to Stormont, not to the border, I'm sorry. We invited them to come from the border to Stormont. Stormont is the capital building of Northern Ireland. And we asked them to hold a, 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 a we, we invited them to dinner. And at the dinner, they would, we asked them to create a border people's manifesto, uh, a statement of their experience of the border and what was important to them and why they weren't on either side of the border, they lived in the middle. And as people arrived, these 135 people arrived, we handed them a card that said, our conversation begins now. And at each point of the evening, we asked them to respond with writing and with conversation. So this is the reception. And then we invited people down to the parliamentarian rooms. And in this case, we have one of the MPs who is meeting with people and talking to them about their experience of the border and what our kinds of issues are raised. And then we invited them to dinner and here they are arriving from the rooms, the parliamentary rooms to the dinner. And you know we had them eat dinner and we also brought them out to do photographs. Each person was individually photographed and then at the, um, at the dinner, we asked them to start thinking about what do people need to know about living on Ireland's border? What is it like to live on a border of any country? What about the borderland would they like to see preserved? And a lot of it for them, what had to do with the ease of transport and traveling back and forth. And then we asked them to put their writing in a ballot box. And over the next couple of weeks, uh, one of the writers we worked with assembled a Border People's Manifesto. And finally, we took them to the museum, the Ulster Museum, to see the results of their work. And this is the th part of the three screen installation that will be at the Whitworth, premiering at the Whitworth next month in Manchester. And this is the, the path that the, um, the yellow hikers took, but we also have a path. You see the boats from the kayaks forming and the yellow manifesto. So I'd like to share with you just a little bit of the conversation and the dinner, just about three minutes. Of so anybody who hasn't been to Stormont before, is this your first time? Well, especially if you've been welcome, and please do not let this be the last time you have this building. This is your building. It's the freedom, it's the freedom on the border. Those people along the border understand freedom, they understand freedom 360 degrees. To them, a border never really was a border because 
there are just so many routes in and out and in and out and up and down that they they would just spend as much time in the south as the north, and it's the it's the freedom. Whereas if you go further into the north and you're you're sort of captive. You you, you feel that there's only one way to go is the land bridge into into, into Britain. Whereas you know um, we understand uh, a 360 degree dimension. The line on the map is is loaded with it, uh, questions of identity. But then you actually come to the landscape and then something else because the line isn't actually here. And instead you find yourself in this much more diffused kind of zone where uh, here we are in this blanket bog and the other side of Kulka, there's a, another blanket bog, very like it. And uh, so you start, it starts to mean something else completely different. Okay, that's just a short taste of what is a three screen projection. Mm. Okay, so that's that's all I've prepared for you today. Did you want to talk about uncertain futures? Oh, no, you're work absolutely work right. I, no, I forgot that. I did, in fact, prepare that. Let me get it back up. It'll be the first time I've actually spoken about it. Wow. Because it's just now starting. I mean, it's just, it's really still very much in process. Mm. So let me get there. So uh, I'll finish this evening talking about um, a project that's underway right now called Uncertain Futures about women, work, and aging in Manchester, England. And um, this is, uh, happening at the Manchester Art Gallery with, um, it's a project that, that we began before COVID. And in that project, uh, we were interested in looking at the future, uh, the future of work for older women because the pension age was changing in England. And it was leaving some women stuck without having planned for a retirement at one age and now suddenly not being able to get their pension for another two years. But then the pandemic hit. And so we started this project in the pandemic and we have so far created the project almost exclusively online. I was worried when uh, the pandemic hit that it would be very difficult to do social practice art because I rely a lot on being present in different places and creating relationships. But I've met with these women, these 15 women who are uh, the advisory committee for Uncertain Futures. And we've met every single week for a year and a half now. So this project has begun to build relationships online. And I I'm, I'm, a little bit surprised <laughs> that we were able to do that. Um, but I think it's particularly a lot having to do with Ruth Edson, the woman up in the upper left, who is a project manager and collaborator. And then you see all these women, we were very carefully and we selected 15 women from different cultures. We were absolutely rigorous with making sure that it would not be dominated by white older women, but that it would include a variety of kinds of older women with different professions from different countries, different immigration status. And um, we've met to create a very, I think, complex but robust social practice project. So here's the Manchester Art Gallery, and here's the partner, the university. Here's the organizations dealing with aging, and here's the city council dealing with public policy. In the middle is the advisory group. The advisory group recruited 100 women to do interviews with, with two scholars from the universities. These interviews were looking at the social conditions now of older women in Manchester, having to do with work, immigration, race, racism, and um, ability, and so on. 
And so the project, we worked and talked and they first began to think about the issues that were critical in their lives. And we developed a project that was about race, migration status, age, gender, disability, and class. And as those intersect, we sit and talk. And we talk about the issues with research scientists who are helping us look at and identify key issues, access to work, experiences of older women in work, the impact of COVID-19, and how they feel about aging and retirement. And all of these issues, caring responsibility, being laid off, all of these issues have come up in this project. So then we decided that these were important issues and we were going to interview 100 women in the middle of the gallery, almost as an ongoing performance. So we identified who are the, who are the women, what are the kind of criteria, how are we going to organize it? And then we built, this is a sketch up, we built a space in the middle of the museum. And in this space, when nobody was in it, you could come in, sit down, you see the stories that are collected on the wall, and you could see an audio, listen to an audio tape and see um, um, a tape. And then when the recordings were going on of these hundred women over three months, you would see you you would see the record the recording taking place. So on the outside of this room is a seating area and another project. And on the inside, you see here an interview in progress. The women came with different languages. There was always a translator in the room for different languages of women. And they then came upstairs for most of the women. It was the first time they were ever in the gallery. We had these blank um, um, places for the interviews to go. And so after an interview was taken place, it went up. We created our sweatshirts, our t-shirts with 100 women in 20 different languages. And this is what you see in this room. You hear the audio tape and you see the projection on the wall from the outside, or you can go inside and you can read one of the texts. We've finished the 100 interviews and now we're beginning the second phase of the project. And that is to convene groups and organizations and to use the interview room as an office space. So we're gonna be doing that for the next months while we read through and interview, I mean, read through the interviews and report out with research projects. In, in um, we're doing a series of symposium, we're doing public events that bring in, we're doing workshops that bring in older women to teach skills to them. And we're working in that policy, research and art areas. So that's the very first time I've spoken about this project. And it's um, definitely in the middle of it, but I'm very excited about what's happening with it. Thank you. It's all yeah. very exciting to learn about your uh, past and ongoing and future projects. And also many questions that I have. But first of all, I wanted to ask you about the color yellow. It's almost like a branding color <laughs> of yeah. all your projects. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not um, a branding color. I happen to like it, but also with Between the Door and the Street, that color very particularly stood out in that particular environment at that moment when the leaves were starting to turn yellow. But that created, um, I didn't have a lot of money in that project. We used it all for organizing. It was a very extensive organizing process. 
And so um, I wanted something to define the street. So we put yellow tape down the curb so that it created like a, um, a line uh, that sort of disappeared into the, into the distance. And then we put pots of yellow flowers at every one of the, the 60 or so porches. Every porch had women on it. And then we put yellow scarves around the women. So when you look down the street, there was a color that really began to create a connection between one group and the other. Um, I guess the Irish one was because if you fly over Ireland, which I've done several times, you look down at the fields and you see there's these yellow flowers called gorsh. It's mm -hmm. a wheat, it grows wild and it kind of grows in lines. And as I was flying in to, um, after visiting the border and trying to figure out what, uh, what we were going to do, I was looking at it and I was thinking, you know, those beautiful yellow lines across the green fields look like kind of borders. And so that's, that's why we began with that project. That's why that color. <laughs> you know, when you think about it, there's only a few colors that vibrate in the, in the environment and yellow is one of them. Hmm, probably, yeah. yeah. And also, uh, I'm always, um, um, I, I always curious and then also respect what you do because of the time that you engage with one project. And uh, one of the, uh, the, some of the experience that I did with all these biennales and triennales, uh, we would love to engage with the community but it's so impossible to yeah. uh, start something with the community. And then also you have to also study and learn about the history of the community and uh, different uh, culture community and diversities. There's so much to learn to just to begin with. And then also you engage with actual people and then also come up with something to do. It's enormous amount of organization. So uh, yeah, maybe I would ask, how you start and uh, how you set up the goal and timing and how does all this large project function? Well, um, I am good at organizing, obviously. And obviously. Uh, at community organizing, as well as organizing people and ideas. And I guess in a way I've been doing it since I was 10 and I used to organize the entire neighborhood to play elaborate games with me. Um, but um, I, I think that it starts usually at this point with an invitation. And sometimes the invitation comes with a topic, like in mm. Ecuador, I was asked to do something on violence against women, very specifically. That's what the curator wanted. Um, in, in Russia, where I'm working right now, I was asked to come and do something that would help bring the community to the museum, to the gallery, mm. or I guess it's actually the House of Culture, they're calling it, and, and um, to help engage with the learning people and the community people, help engage people with the actual um, operations of, of the space, mm. the VAC Foundation. But sometimes I'm asked just to come and do a project without a particular idea in mind. So when I get there, I tend to, to map out the socio, um, the social structures, mm -hmm. the governmental, the non-governmental, the, um, you know, the different religious sort of who, who's operating in that field around that issue. And then I meet with people and try to find people who might want to work with me because we share the same perspectives and the same goals. And I try to find activities that make sense for an organization. Organizations are under so much stress now. It's, it's difficult to come in and say, would you like to do something really different to add to your workload? So instead, it's a matter of finding the kinds of activities that you can do together. 
there, there are some projects and, and then for me, um, I tend to work to develop imagery with people, uh, with people that have emerged as potential collaborators. Mm -hmm. And I might come up with an idea or somebody else might come up with an idea and then it sort of builds. You know, everybody says, wow, I like sitting on stoops. I was in between the door and the street. I kept, I was living right on that street and I kept walking up and down the street. And one day I thought, well, this is interesting. People sit on these stoops. This is part of their culture is in the summertime when it's warm, they all sit out on the stoops and talk to each other. And that's how the project began. All the image began, but I knew I was working with um, what were the changing ideas of feminism from my generation to the current generation. And so that was the subject. And then the image became the street in Brooklyn where we could have people thinking about new ideas about feminism. We could have a group of women from a domestic violence shelter talking about their idea of feminism, their problems that they're dealing with. We could have a group of women who had been in prison. We could have a group of house cleaners. We could have a group of restaurant workers. And all of them would address this issue about gender. We could have men addressing gender from their own perspective. So it became, in that case, a, a, a giant conversation that took place over an hour with all these different, literally there were 360 women and men, a few men, and, and some uh, trans people, all thinking together in their groups, talking about the issues of, of you know, where were we at now, today, that was different from 1970. Yeah, it's always such a broad issue. And uh, yeah, as you, as you said, it's broad and also quite diverse. And even you start with the idea of the feminism, then it goes to so, so many different alleys and uh, little uh, stream. So uh, you certainly have to be a good organizer. But I wonder if you have something in cautious um, uh, every time, particularly when you work with the people who you don't know well, like a new environment, new uh, community, and then also new history that you didn't know until you start researching. Well, I, I think that I work a little different than some artists who research a lot. I don't tend to read books on Russia, on Moscow. I don't tend to do typical art artist research. I research in the field. I get most of my information from people. Mm -hmm. I mean, they educate me about all kinds of things. It's not just who they are. If if I talk to politicians, they they kind of lay out the political structure. If I talk to religious leaders, they talk about the differences in religion and in a sense, what I like about this work is that I learn a lot. I love learning and listening to people. And I love people who are different than me. Um, and it's sort of like there's this massive world out there and there's all these people with all these ideas. Hmm. Um, and, and so it's, it's very exciting for me to do my so-called research because it involves a lot of time. It involves me listening to people and, and trying to find the places where, where my values connect with their values. And when you find these connective places, um, then, then you begin to generate, co-generate um, an agenda, you know, a, a shared agenda. And the agenda is the project. <laughs> And there are some points where there's differences. I mean, that there, it's a lot of negotiating uh, that takes place. And I, I spend a lot of time thinking about what it means to make an image and what it means to work with people who have a very different experience. But the images that I contribute to this kind of environment 
they, they, they are my image, not, you know, they're, they're not my images necessarily in their origination, but, but they are eventually because of my producing of them, my images, I have to like them and want to do them. But I'm very aware that my images come from my culture mm -hmm. and my perspective. I have a lot of images with cars, for example, that probably wouldn't be all that relevant to Japan, um, <laughs> you know, or at least to Tokyo. So, so uh, places where you're very familiar with mass transportation. So, mm. so I'm always aware that there's a way that I'm not a hundred percent reflecting the experience and reality of other people, but there's a place where we come together. Mm. And hopefully it approaches a representation. And a lot of the representation comes from people's speaking, people's language. In the Manchester project, there's probably 20 different languages and there's a hundred different women that are participating with their experience. Um, and, and that's all very different than my experience. Even my experience as an older woman is different than their experience mm -hmm. as older women from, from Africa, mm -hmm. for example. I think uh, uh, you walk between the doors and the street. Something I was quite interested in is that all those little sentences and edited words that uh, participants are talking, Mm -hmm. It makes the entire story so true and also so real. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you said, I think it's interesting how you do your own research and then also this, the process of transforming information and network you collected and transforming that into a piece of art. And that process is highly complicated and difficult. I yeah. know so many projects that has uh, enormous amount of effort to do this research, but this transforming process of making that content into a piece of art doesn't always become sure. the level that uh, we want to see. And then also the level right. that, uh, we, that would speak to another group of people who would come and see the project in the museum. I think I started to say that at the beginning of the lecture and, and, and didn't carry it through, but um, I have, with these last few pieces, thought a lot about, for a long time, I didn't care much about museums. Uh, and, and I don't have a gallery-based uh, practice. You know, I don't have a gallery. Um, and um, so I was, I was more interested in the way the work operated in public. But because but I've always shown in galleries and museums. And that process of translation from the public, from the street to the gallery has always been an interesting one. Sometimes that translation is through news media, like with In Mourning and In Rage. And sometimes it's a lot of the time early on in social practice and performance art, it was documentary. But over time, the styles of museum display uh, have become more and more sophisticated. And it, it, I, and I like that. I love large scale video installations. You know, I love the way works appear in the museum. But, but I began to notice that some things that look like social practice in a museum aren't social practice. You can go into a community for a week and do a video and make it look like you have been embedded for a year in the community. Mm -hmm. It's very deceptive. And so I started thinking, okay, so I love working in community and I love the visual scale and spectacle that's evolving in museums. It's becoming more and more intriguing to me. And so how do I match those? So with the Ecuador project, which you haven't seen tonight, but uh, I, I know you know about, and yeah. on violence against women, I went back after the performance and restaged a different kind of activity that was men walking in and out of the bullring and reading letters written by women 
I went uh, back to Briarfield <clears throat> and made a two screen video that is a projection of the circle and the square. And um, in the case of a cross and in between, I created a work that operated along the border in Ireland, Ireland and now will have a very vibrant life within the museum world. And I don't know yet if people going from Briarfield to the museum will be happy. I think they will, and I hope they will, because the first time we showed that piece was back in their community and they loved it. So now they'll come to Manchester and see it in the Whitworth. And I'm sure they'll love it. They're participating in the opening, they're chanting and doing shape note singing. But, but I think that's the goal of those projects for me was trying to create something equally strong within a community with integrity and that has its operations in the museum in another way, close to, but different than that original experience. So that's, that's sort of something I'm, I'm really interested in. I'm moving on to another subject uh, now with my work. Um, and that has to do with working with learning people in different museums and think and community people and thinking about the program that they're developing. In Manchester, all of those works, including the, the Older Women Project, the, the Uncertain Futures, they're all geared toward being a prototype, um, almost a schemata for how you can work on other issues like that in your community. So in, in Manchester, we're showing projects that I did in Oakland with teenagers, and they're starting their own projects with teenagers using my project as a model. So, so I think that this next phase of work that I'm entering is how do you work with an institution, a museum? Like how would I work with the Mori? And the, if, if your agenda was to truly engage a particular population, how would we work together to co-design that project? So I'm doing that at the Whitworth and at the VAC Foundation in Russia right now. And I think I'll be doing it at Queen's Museum mm. with uh, Sally Talent, the new director. Mm. Yeah. If we raise the right amount of money, we'll be able to do a project that really builds on what she's already doing, the community organizing, developing an institution of care post-pandemic mm. in a very um, uh, underprivileged community very rich and diverse community, but mm -hmm. one of the poorest communities in the country. Um, she's really, re Sally's reorienting the museum to be truly porous with the community. And so I'm kind of intrigued with what she's doing and would love to work with her on that project. So that's sort of my I, next, yeah, I think, I think that my next part agenda. Is, <laughs> I think that part is so important to uh, as you said, how how you engage with the Fatman community, but also how we can speak to different community who comes to the museum, and how the one work could connect different communities, mm -hmm. and uh, that's also something I often think that uh, as soon as we make this participatory practice, or as soon as we make this gender issue expression, mm -hmm. then who, who are related to the issue comes to the show or participate, mm -hmm. but who think who the, it's not my business, it's not my problem, they don't come. So uh, it's so important to open up the specific issue to the, the other group of people who think it doesn't relate to themselves. Yeah, and you know, I, I think it's different for each, uh, also each gallery or museum because, because you have different directors and they have different agendas. And, and um, some are very robust, you know, like with Sally Talent trying to make the whole museum into another kind of programming. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And some are, are smaller. They invite an artist in to do an engage project, and then they do another engage project over here. Um, and, I mean, they're, they're all valid ways of working. It's sort of like what you said about the bien, uh, Biennales and the Triennales. I, I remember there was a period in time after the Biennales became quite, you know, um, engaged, uh, or, or we began that as a practice, there was a short period of time, I think there was a Biennale in Brazil, where they were suddenly going to do the whole Biennale as a series of engaged projects. It was mm. That was what they were going to do. And they did encounter the problem you're talking about, which is the, the longevity issue. Um, and they got artists who were already working in communities to come do something there. And they had a couple of artists that, um, that, that worked long term over time. Um, and um, I'm hearing feedback, are you? No. Oh, okay, good. And they had a couple of uh, artists who worked over time, came back and forth for six months. Um, so that's always been a, a question in social practice, which is how do you continue the work? Is it, is it a problem for an artist just to come in and then leave again? They used to call it parachuting. Um, after all the years of my work, I actually don't think it's a problem, but I think your expectations have to be adjusted to the amount of resource and time that, that actually exists in the environment to continue the work, if that's a goal of the work. I don't think all work needs to continue forever institutions don't continue forever you know so so i think it's good to be thoughtful but i don't think the value of a good social practice project is that it continues after the artist leaves i don't think that's particularly relevant actually it's interesting that um you have more and more opportunity to work in overseas and an unknown community. Maybe the Manchester is no longer an unknown community for you, but uh, you started from really specifically in LA and your local city and uh, knowing the diverse social problems within your own city. And around, when was the time that you started to be invited by uh, the institution in, in long distance and you have to change the way of working or um, how do you see the differences? Uh, well, there are definitely different working in your own community because you have more time. And when I work abroad, because I go back four or five times for, you know, a week, three weeks, um, and I have people that I create relationships with that expand the project, um, I, I think, you know, I think it, 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 it emulates living in a place. Um, it's not living in a place, but it's like living in a place because even living in a place, you don't see the same people all the time. Mm -hmm. You just get to see them more regularly. Uh, but I started, mm -hmm. I think, I don't, I, I always traveled a lot. I, I came from a performance art background. And in the 70s, two things were possible, cheap travel and um, the fact that as a performance artist, you had to travel because, you, you, you know, you took your body and your work right, wherever right. you went. So I, I've always traveled a lot. I, in the early 90s, I was working on a project in Finland. Um, I've worked on projects in England. Um, so, but I would say probably around the 90s, I began to do more and more work abroad. And, and part of that for me is that it, it was intriguing. It was interesting. You know, why should I not go to Russia and stay in LA? You know, I like to go to Russia and see what's going on there and see how the people are and how they live and what they think about. <laughs> um. Yeah, maybe my question goes too much back to the earlier career of your time. But uh, yeah, maybe I thought we should ask how 
your practice from performance art, spread it to now so-called socially engaged art. Probably back then, there was a different ways of calling, yeah. but uh, I'm curious about how you developed towards the, where you are. Well, I started art even through the lens of feminism by working with Judy Chicago in Fresno. Right. I was going to be a doctor and I ended up an artist, unfortunately, for my economic situation. Um, and um, so, so I actually, but I had a lot of other social concerns. I was always involved with anti-racist activities and the farm worker movement and different kinds of political actions that, that you know, the anti-war movement. So, so basically we were encouraged with, within Judy's teaching environments, both at Fresno State and at CalArts, to explore issues through our work. So my performance tended to have a slant toward some kind of issue or the other, whether it was working in Watts around um, white black relationship in our, in our country um, uh, in the seventies or working with older women. Actually, I started working with older women when I was 28. Um, because I saw that older women, um, you, you, if, you're, if you're interested in accomplishment and achievement and power to some degree as a woman, it's pretty obvious that as you get older, that power decrease, decreases. That's not as true now, and it's not as true in, it's true in specific environments. If you're in an academic environment, your power continues to accrue to you as a woman academic. But if you're out in the world, you disappear. And a lot of my early works were on the disappearance of older women, um, the inevitable associations that you showed yeah. in one of the first works about older women and, and how they disappear within the environment um, and um, how it's different to see an older woman and to think about aging than it is to be an older woman. So, um, so I started with gender issues and race issues, and then um, you know began to expand as I expanded environments. But a lot of my early work was on significant gender issues like violence against women. I did individual performance work but also began to organize larger scale works. And probably one of the first of those was three weeks in May. So around the mid seventies, I went from individual performance about issues to performance structures, I called them at the time. Now you would call them platforms. You know, everybody creates these platforms where you do all this organizing and thinking and learning and teaching and and essentially three weeks in may was a very large platform and at the center of it was um the maps that i marked where people were raped every day for for three weeks uh reports that i got from the police department so those two phases of my work the individual performance and the large-scale social action uh, sort of over time grew to where I wasn't, I'm not interested in performing as an individual anymore. Um, I'm, I'm interested in directing uh, large scale social projects. And they're very nicely, they can be very nicely, uh, you can create evocative imagery within video, which is one of the reasons video and photography, I work so much in those media. Um, and they stay true to the experience, but they can communicate in another way in a museum like in the Mori. I don't know, did you get the experience? Did you get, begin to get the sensation with, the, I've not seen the three screen projection large on a wall. Yeah, I think uh, three screen projection was quite successful because of the fact that a project was based on one street. So it delivered the feeling or experience of walking through the street ah. back and forth and popping into a different porch. And uh, so I think this lineage of the installation worked really well. Mm -hmm. 
I'm working on a new project now from the, the performance I did around the same time at Tate Modern. And um, it's going to be very different. It's going to be multi-screen, hmm. but, but it won't necessarily be a big projection. I see. Because, because what it has is really deeply engaged conversation between older women hmm. about the political movements they were involved in. Hmm. If we had it done in time, it would have been great for your show because it's all these women from the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s talking about Greenham Commons and the peace work or talking about the minor strike. Hmm. And so I think it'll be more you know, television monitors with these really deeply engaged, lengthy conversations, and it'll probably only be of interest to people in England. <laughs> <laughs> um, besides um, Judy Chicago, can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about uh, your experience working with Alan Kaplow? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I met him in Cal at CalArts at a moment where he was really changing his own form. He tried very large scale, well, he did, he didn't try. He did very large scale happenings um, and, and he was moving into a new way of thinking about art. His ideas led him to merit many different forms and to exper experimenting in different ways. And um, I, I think I took him as a model. <laughs> for better or worse, probably for worse career-wise, because he had the same kinds of issues that I did, which is he sort of boxed himself. I, I mean, I, did, I haven't had the reputation of boxing myself out of museums, but in a way he did. You know, he made such a strong statement about how lifelike art and art-like art were different. Right. That in a sense, and, and he sort of dematerialized during that era of dematerialization to the point where he was really just giving instructions. And then people would go off and give instruction and follow the instructions and then come back and talk about him. That's what was going on when I met him. So I was very intrigued as, as I moved bigger and bigger, he was moving in a more and more reductive way into ideas that um, that were very influential to me. And mainly they were the how life and art intersect and when is it one and when is it the other? And I found mm. that a really intriguing model for feminist activists because we could do, and now you see it all the time, you see people doing marches and parades and then they call it art, right? So, so he, he created people like him and Boyce and, and uh, different, different artists playing with these ideas about art, created an environment where the, the, the band, the, the sort of boundaries of art were much more elastic. Um, in a sense, my going back to showing things in museums is conventional, in, you know, more conventional in that term. The problem is I always loved beauty, <laughs> you know, I don't think Alan cared uh, for that concept of beauty. I think um, he would find like Alan Sakula did that it was maybe seductive and problematic, but I love large scale video. Mm -hmm. I love beautiful paintings, you know, and, and so, so for me to, to kind of move my work into that environment. It's always been there, but to move it more specifically in that mm -hmm. environment uh, and, and to create for it is probably not a path Alan would have taken. Mm. Yeah, it's so interesting. Yeah, I was also inspired by him a lot about how museum could uh, have a relationship with the audience in a different level. And, yes. and then also intersection between art and life is always a fascinating, huge question that you can re never really draw a fine line. And, um, but I was also um, curious about asking a little bit more about the people in the community after the project that uh, you explained a little bit about 
in our Sacred and Square projects that have people started continue relationship. And then also uh, some of the project participants in LA continue working in the community after the project. So uh, yeah, if you, if you could uh, yeah, share any of those experiences that are, even you left as a mediator of the community for the project. And some people continued relationship, maybe not as an art, but uh, ties and connections between the uh, community continued. It sort of depends on how long you work and how, what are the, what are the, um, what's the viability of the groups you work with? Mm -hmm. What's their ability to continue uh, work, you know, along a certain line? And, and in the case, uh, I was invited to Briarfield by a group called Super Slow Way and the director, Lori Peake, knew, knew me, knew my work and invited me to work there. And then she brought another institution, a small arts group called In Situ. Mm -hmm. And then we collectively brought in Building Bridges Pendle, which is um, the Sufi group, and Ralph Bashir, who is doing organizing in that area. And, and the thing is that it, it's not my project that continued, but those organizations were strong enough that the relationships people made and the ideas that we worked together on for two years um, created the, the momentum for other work to go on. So I would never say that the project did it. I, don't, I think that's not the way it works in life. Um, I think that the project created relationships and forms of thinking so that right now there's a, a British choral uh, director working with a Nasheed uh, singer and they're working to bring those forms of music together, which we provided a platform for and a metaphor for in the project, but they may well have met each other and done it anyway, you know what I mean? and Super Slow Way continues to support. In situ is actually in the mill now. They got an office in oh, the mill, wow. a new, new building. So, so I, I just think that a lot, of, um, a lot of the continuation of work has to do more with the community hmm. than it does the art projects. Hmm. Hmm. Although I think a lot of artists claim that they had something to do with it. I but I think it's it's if it's beautiful to say that our art project became some kind of, some kind of seed or fuel to the community soil, yeah. and then if they could care that plant, then grow as a bigger tree. Yeah, I and I think I think that um, as long as you're careful not to say that the art project did it all. Mm, yeah, because I think that takes over people's autonomy and their own, you know, I think that's kind of egoistic to do that mm -hmm. as an artist. But I think in the terms that you would see it, which is the art planted the seed, I think that's a very good metaphor mm -hmm. for it. And that, that the community found the richness of relationship and the importance of intercultural mm -hmm. exchange in that case and built on some very hard work of the people mm. that, that are there. Yeah, I think uh, uh, particularly after this COVID experience, that are people particularly in the art community questioned about role of art and museum were questioned, are we necessarily for the society or for the time like this? And uh, so I think your new project of the uh, old women uh, is fascinating like after spending two years gathering together and then see how that seed will start seeing some leaves um, in the museum space. And But I think uh, yeah. the art and life issue was strongly questioned 
really in the last two years. And it's uh, great timing, I think, to really come up and face to that uh, long, long question at this time. That's really interesting, Mommy. How do you think the art life question has come up? How has it come up for you at the Mori? Yeah, particularly as a museum, and we had to close for state of emergency. And uh, so a lot of people said, uh, art is so essential for human life and well-being, and we should open the museum. And, uh, but for some people who never really came to the museum, probably it did not matter because the art wasn't part of their life. And then suddenly it doesn't come into their life during the COVID. So uh, it's still, I think, an ongoing question. So I'm really questioning to myself and then also trying really hard to think how a museum or art could be essential for the people who had art already or not. Yeah, I think I think art and beauty is essential for people, I, but it, it always comes up against you know um, the the deep needs of human life. I remember when I was doing the crystal quilt you know, and the projects I did with older women, I had people that questioned why a, a foundation would support that project instead of Meals on Wheels, free food for the mm -hmm. elderly. I think in a sense, that's a false comparison. And the reason it's a false comparison is that society should be catering you know, society should pay for people to have food, not pay to make bombs and missiles and pay to, you know, spend billions of dollars in Afghanistan. You know, we should be able to expect that people will eat. So that in addition to that, people need beauty. But when you pose them as either or, you're either going to have food or you're going to have art. I think that's a false dichotomy. Right. The issue is you should have art and life or bombs, which do you want, <laughs> you, you know? Um, so I, I think, I mean, right now in the United States, we're really caught up in this horrible dilemma of having a, a, a democratic administration, which is trying for the first time to actually pass laws for people. And the conversation doesn't focus on why did we spend you know, billions of dollars in Af Afghanistan, and why are we still spending billions of dollars on w the war industry? The conversation is, we can't afford to pay for medical care for poor people. We can't afford it, but we can afford gigantic airplanes that bomb other people. It's, it's really, um, I think when you try to talk about what's more valuable art, or, or something else, eating. I mean, obviously you have to eat, but to pose those against each other is not to take the bigger picture, which is how are we spending our resources writ large? Hmm. Yeah, I think people uh, are often talking about the idea of well-being, which is not only about the physical wellness, but mm -hmm. also uh, mental wellness and then also social wellness. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think those issues will come up strongly also in um, art community in coming years, but how could we recover from this pandemic experience and uh, how we could talk about bigger picture, but at the same time, how we could reach to individual emotions and experiences yeah. and problems. Yeah. So uh, I think um, the kind of the project that you have been doing might have a different meaning in post-pandemic time. And uh, yeah, I think I keep questioning about these uh, complex issues and uh, the line between art and life and intersection, that fascinating, ambiguous area, I think will continue. 
Yeah. I would be very curious to, you know, people have asked me how I fared during the pandemic and how is it changing things? And I don't have much to offer on that. And I would be very curious from your point of view, how you're thinking about that. That how, what, what are the issues we're going to face coming out of the pandemic era? How is it going to change art practice, do you think? Yeah, I think that is essential question um, of the role of art in our life. Mm -hmm. Will we keep uh, asked and, uh, but also uh, the role of imagination of mm -hmm. thinking about others. Mm -hmm. And once you have difficult situation, then I think it makes it easier for people to think about others because you have something to correspond to in a different situation. So uh, the role of imagination for the different situation and diverse uh, situation that is probably not about you for the moment, but it could be about you in next year or to even tomorrow. So that kind of um, the how you expand your imagination or how you train your imagination comes from diverse experiences of meeting with a different mm -hmm. uh, background and context. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think that imagination can be trained. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do so, too. I think that it's the other word I would introduce is empathy. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. That that you know, I mean, what, I, I'm not sure the relationship between imagination and empathy, but I, I suspect there's a fairly strong one yeah. uh, or possibly a strong one. And I think empathy is something that, that we need to think a lot more about how we teach because one of the problems with the politics that is going on in this country is a complete lack of empathy and a complete vilification of the other, whoever the other is there's really strong black and white lines that are being drawn now. And um, I, I think when you draw a line or a border, like the border going on in Ireland, mm. I think that, that what happens is people entrench into their positions and you don't have an empathic response to the other. And does that shut down imagination? Mm, I mean, definitely imagination for the apocalypse is happening now. Mm. So I'm not sure that the divide stops imagination, but it does promote a kind of an imagination of, of fear, you know, an imagination of, of terror or division or, you know, impending doom. And I do think that, that COVID exacerbated the division and the mm. separation and I think that the work of, of empathy and coming together, that's why that Manchester project's interesting because we, we did come together through right. shared, shared value and empathy, and we weren't sitting next to each other. Mm. To do it. I rely a lot on what I would call the haptic quality, haptic quality of organizing, mm. touching, looking at people, sensing their, their bodies in space. Mm -hmm hugging and and you can't do that virtually so um i think if the art can continue to, to, to think a lot about empathy and connectivity that that's going to be an important thing to to focus on yeah i agree and then also i think the image that you showed us with the horse passing through the yellow border and the powder kind of blows up in the air. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can think that, um, that all these borders or like divide in a society could be that mm -hmm. kind of a yellow powder. Mm -hmm. And if you try to run through it, then uh, that will kind of dissolve in the air. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe it wasn't ex existing. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, this is also a combination of imagination and an empathy that uh, we could uh, project probably better future together through these different projects. Very well said. Thank you. I think this is um, probably a good timing for ending. Okay. And I really appreciate for sharing your such an exciting coming project. And I really hope that I can 
come and see and also hug you. Yes. Before too long. Yes. Come come to Manchester. I'll meet you there. All right. Next time you go to England. Okay. Lovely talking to you, Mommy. Thanks so much. And I look forward oh, to it again. Pleasure is mine. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.